thinking of a master plan. plan. I'm trying to mask my plan. Look alone, it's better hide. That's why the gas in my hand. Trying to find myself in places, man, I shouldn't be searched. Walk them down upon this earth, that's all the truth. And it's hurting out there trying to mask a man. I'm trying to mask my plan. Look alone, it's better hide. That's why the gas in my hand. Trying to find myself in places, man, I shouldn't be searched. Walk them down upon this earth, that's all the truth. And it's hurting out there trying to mask a man. I'm trying to mask my plan. Look alone, it's better hide. That's why the gas in my hand. Trying to find myself in places, man, I shouldn't be searched. Walk them down upon this earth, that's all the truth. And it's hurting out there trying to mask a man. I'm trying to mask my plan. Look alone, it's better hide. That's why the gas in my hand. Trying to find myself in places, man, I shouldn't be searched. Walk them down upon this earth, that's all the truth. And it's hurting out there trying to mask a man. I'm trying to mask my plan. You know, gotta do what you gotta do Hit the block with my Glock, pocket full of T's and blues Game ain't changed, niggas, it's all different The streets is watching, everybody's a damn witness In these streets, I'm a menace Homie, I stand my ground, I'm a shine the dude Shy town's finest, dude Whoa, cause I'm cool and I'm fresh Nigga, yeah, I'm cool and I'm fresh I'm still cool and I'm still fresh All these niggas Hey, it's Miss Sandy. How are you doing? Listen, season number four. Yes, I am excited about our new guest. This right here, I think we're going to go past uh, eight episodes. So I just want you to get ready and whatnot. Um, what I want to do is um, I want to introduce you to, we, we're going to call her Tracy for right now. <laughs> Tracy Lee. Um, I met this young lady some, some time ago. And we were conversing and whatnot. And um, when I when I heard her book, I was like, I don't know if y'all ready for this. But if you're not ready, it's coming the way it goes. So we're going to go ahead and begin. And I'm going to let uh, Miss Tracy introduce herself. And then we're just going to, you know how we do, we just flow. And we're going to see where it goes. Is that all right? Okay. Hi, I am Tracy. That's what I prefer to be called. Um, Born in California, raised in the city of Chicago, and if I have a, have a, does, do I have a story for you? So let's begin. So tell us, because we don't want to give them too much. You want to want to kind of like ease it out. Okay. But for this particular episode, um, talk about just growing up as a child in Chicago. What what was that like for you? Well, I got to Chicago. I was five years old. My dad uh, was a bank robber in L.A. Wait a minute, what? My dad was a bank robber Okay, y'all heard that? All right, okay, go ahead. And Mama wanted to keep all the things that she had gotten from the robberies, so she took her things and ran it to her hometown, which is Chicago. And um, so I got to Chicago winter of uh, mm, 68, and... I don't remember a whole lot about being a child. I don't know why. Um, I can remember maybe 11 years old, but from five to 11, I guess I was just a normal child. Right, right, right. And um, we lived with my grandmother, which was really great. I grew up a normal child, no molestation, no incest. I had three sisters, my mother and my grandmother. I had a good childhood. Awesome. That's then when I turned to a teenager, things started to change and the world started to look a lot different around me. But I didn't know how to deal with the pain that I had went through. I wanted another young lady or teenager girl to know what the streets really were about. So what was your introduction to the street? Uh, I'd say marijuana. Okay. And how old were you? I was probably 14, 15. Okay. And we had some neighbors move in that people start moving out of the projects. Chicago, uh, Mayor Daly had built projects. Um, I think a 17 story building, eight families per floor. Mm -hmm. And it backfired on the city of Chicago because the cops couldn't come in and they couldn't catch anybody. Once you were in there, you know. It, the cops couldn't, they couldn't save you, they couldn't help you. And these people wanted to get out of the projects. They're all gone today because it was a project that failed. Mm. You couldn't stack people on top of each other. And, um, what's the word I'm looking for? And have any authority over them. Because right. you. So I, I think we have a, a clip of that. So, um, so that was the brown building I saw when you were doing your uh, your footage. Right. That's the building you're talking about. And of yes. course, you guys are looking at it right now. 
Um, so you said that it was 17 stories high and eight families per floor. How yes. big were the rooms? They were normal Pretty. size rooms. Well, they were like was it like a three, master four bedroom? Bed. Okay, it was a regular size apartment. It was, it was okay, nice. Pre- it was actually nice. Mine was nice. Right. Because I saw the building, so I'm thinking into me mm-hmm. when I was looking at. It, I was thinking, huh? It didn't look. Um, I see your point though, because when I at first glance I was like, okay, well that's a pretty small building, but we had eight families per floor, so that was talking about maybe each family having anywhere from what three, four bedrooms possibly in their apartment, maybe. Mm, mostly two, two okay, bedrooms. Two bedrooms. I don't okay. remember really one bedrooms in the project, but I could be wrong. Okay, and so you said they had no way to really kind of like come in and, and control the environment. No, because if two cops came into the project, they don't even know if they're going to make it out because they had no power. It was too many of us. We had the gotcha. power. So we weren't even scared of them. You would just look out and say, you know, uh, I'm sure they had ways to let you know. Police just pulled up in front of the building. Mm-hmm. You, could, you could look out your window and see all of State Street for three, four, five blocks each way. So... We had the advantage, and we took advantage. You know, it became uh, dens for auto thieves, rapists, drug dealers, drug addicts, and was nothing. Uh, people were murdered when they tore those buildings down. They found a lot of a lot of skeletons on top of those buildings. Oh wow! Well, they took the people up to the top of them, and nobody. I guess they never did aerial views over the projects, and they would have saw the bodies up there. Mm-hmm. So they didn't care. And that's, you know, I I really believe that growing up in the hood, I felt hopeless. I felt hopeless. I would look for a job every day. I said, I'm going to find a job. I'm not going to live like this. And when I walk in, they look at me like, we don't want to hire you. You know, like, uh, then the the Arabs came into our neighborhoods and opened stores. So I went to this one Arab, and they basically wanted you to be their girlfriend. Um, and I'm asking for a job. And this one guy gave me a shot, and he told me every time somebody comes in to purchase, whether they have cash or food stamps, always hit the tax button. And I said, I'm not doing that. He said, Well, that's what I do. I said, Yeah, but do you think that black people don't know that something that costs 99 cent is 99 cent and not a dollar eight cent or dollar seven cent? He was like, They never complain. Just hit this button. And I knew that I wasn't going to make it wow. there. Wow. But, so why did they want a girlfriend? Well, I guess we were new to them. They were new to us. They had come into the area and they figured that we had no morals. I don't know what the Arabs thought of. Uh, they didn't mess with all the women, but certain women. I know I was one of them. That um, to this day, even the ones in Texas today, mm-hmm. you know, it's just something about the light-skinned woman. I don't know. Right. right. And um, they'll try to talk to you, but. Um, they don't really want much, but yeah. they don't, you know, so they, they, want to turn, they want to turn the trick, in other words. Yeah, yeah. They got their wife at home. They don't want her in the store, but they won't hire us. Today, you'll see the Arab woman in the store. I don't know what the change is, but they letting the women drive. And yeah. Anyway, um, the area of the building I, that, um, that I lived in was Stateway Gardens. Okay. And Stateway ran from 39th and State. Ooh, no, no, no. 35th in state to 40, maybe 43rd. It was like maybe six, seven, eight buildings. Okay. But I could be wrong. (laughs) I'm not sure. And so they had, and all of them were pretty much built like that as far as the state. Some were, 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 were regular brick color, like rust. That was Robert Taylor Homes. Then you had Stateway was the white buildings. Then Cabrini Green, of course, uh, Northside. Wait a minute, Cabrini Green, that's Candyman. Yes. I'm stupid. I guess I, yeah. I love the Candyman. Really? Yes. And you know, I wasn't scared of none of them. Wow. It, it, Chicago just didn't scare me. I walked through alleys because I had been there my whole life. You know, I'm just trying to get a shortcut. And I had a boyfriend catch me coming out of the alley. He's like, you know, I'm sneaking around. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I said, I'm just taking a shortcut. He said, why are you in the alley? And I'm like, that's not an alley. And I look back at the alley. I was like, oh, boy. I was in the alley. It didn't, you know. So was Chicago rough? Chicago is rough, but your community is your community. And so I was never afraid of my community, but I was pretty rough myself. Uh, I was one to be reckoned with. Okay, all right, let, let them know, let's tell us. 
<laughs> yeah, I was pretty rough. Uh, I don't. I, I think when you watch pimps and players and Fluky Stokes and uh, Magic Don Juan, when you watch these people, you learn a little something from them, and it's just called hustling. So if they're not gonna give me a job, I'm gonna make a job, and I did. I'm not ashamed, I'm ashamed of it, I'm not proud of it, but then I was, because I was basically like everyone else. I became a product of my environment. That's what I saw, that's what I did. And um, I thank God I lived through it. So during that time you were coming up, did y'all see like the pimps on the corners and was that something that was normal? At 15, 16, 17, you saw the Blackstone Rangers. And they was, would be on every corner. Wait a minute, I don't know. That, the Blackstone that? Rangers, well, we had a, a hotel called the Blackstone. Okay. So we didn't realize that that was, that, I'm sure that name, I don't think it had anything to do with the gang, but I don't know that. Right. And these guys were where the, 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 uh, the what do you call it? Like mm -mm. A, the tam like a, like not the turban, but you know, mm -mm. Um, beret. Oh, okay. They would wear the berets, and it was the scariest thing being. 14, 15, trying to go to school, and every corner you get to, there's another man and another man, and they're everywhere, until the man came and said, we're not here to hurt you, we're here to help you. Get uh -huh. on to school, I'm watching you, you know. Not like that, and they would let you know, we're not here for you. What it was, their, I don't know, I guess, leader, was in the hotel, and there was a man at a certain parameter around that building to keep the other gang, out mm -hmm. and nowhere near. I'm, with, I'm saying this would be Jeff Fort, if you ask me. The Blackstone. Um, I know a little bit. I used to know more, but I don't know a whole lot today. But I'm thinking it would be Jeff Fort would be there. No, because he had the fort on 47th Street and Drexel. Jeff Fort and Larry Hoover. That's Larry Hoover's gang, uh, Gangster Disciples. Okay, I'm off track, but no, um, no, you good because I'm not from there, so an audience definitely. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I think that would be Angela Davis days. Got you. We don't, we don't know nothing about that. The Black Panthers. Okay, yeah, those so were they Black were, Panthers. Got you. And Blackstone Rangers. They was in that Blackstone Hotel. In, in by the seventies, those were Rangers, Blackstone Rangers, I believe. Okay. And uh, they protected the neighborhood. Wow. They protected their leader. I'm, I'm going to take that back. But they were watching us. I like children. that. I like that. Because, you know, like, <clears throat> I wasn't nowhere near around none of that at that time. So I always wondered, um, being in the East Coast, we always got black history. Mm -hmm. So Black Panthers were something we knew. But we always saw them because they were the ones that were in the community mm -hmm. that was um, feeding, exactly. coming by the schools. This other stuff that... Uh, the news media and the propaganda has shown has shown them like criminals but that wasn't what you saw coming up correct well, they were protecting their leader but i felt protected right in the community after i realized when after the man said to me i'm not here to hurt you i'm doing my thing you go to school and i knew then and every day he was there every day wow so I, we got used to them, and then we had guardian angels that rode the bus and rode the train. I remember them. Y'all had them in um, oh, yes. Chicago, too? You had to. Chicago was, you couldn't even wear a gold chain. Hmm. You were, um, I had an incident. I moved um, on the third floor. My mom lived on the first floor. I moved on uh, 81st of Marshfield in Chicago, and these people don't know me. They don't know my background. They don't know what I've been through, they don't know about all my drug trafficking, my drug dealing, and this guy reaches out and grabs my coat to see my body under the coat. Mm -hmm. And I went ballistic. I reach, I reach for an imaginary gun. Right. Because you know, that's what I used to, I used to right. be a gun right. at. Right. I was going to the store for my mom. And I, I reached, I'm like, don't put your hand on me. And it, the dude did, the, the dude's like, I said, you know who I am? He's like, no, and I don't want to. And we go our separate ways, and the girl rings my bed. She said, they're going to kill you. I said, kill me for what? Do you know who that was? I said, no, do you know who I am? And she's <laughs> like, no, we don't know nothing about you. We just know that's your mother. And since we know that's your mother, you better watch your back, because they'll hurt your mother. 
So I put on my hat because I was Where trying to be he? somebody. He was the the, the a drug dealer. A big he was it? But that's um, that's a level that everybody's not doesn't have or get to say. Do you know who that is? That's mm-hmm. the one with the stuff. She used something big mm-hmm. to the little people, mm-hmm. but to the older people, you just another drug dealer. Mm-hmm. So I cocked my hat. I, I wore. Two leather coats because it's so cold. So one yeah, yeah. has the fur up here, and one is is uh, the, you gotta have one to here, one down to cover your, your the rest of your body. So this guy thought that my guess my coat was too long. He was trying to see you know who I am or I don't know what he thought. Mm-hmm. So I go downstairs. I said, Do we have a problem? Because I don't want nothing. You know I don't tell him anything. But look him dead in his face. Do we have a problem? Because we gonna just shoot it out now. Right. And he's like, No, no, me and you don't have no problem. I was like, okay, thank yeah. you. My name is Tracy. Shake his hand. Uh, he introduces and himself. Old, and how old were you? Oh, now, now I'm in my 20s. This is okay. the worst. This is the worst Tracy you ever wanted to meet. Right. Okay, so, that, so, <laughs> so, wait a minute, so they know. So we have two names, right? We have two names, right? <laughs> no. This one name. Tracy. Okay. So Tracy is uh, street. So you got to My mother said she wanted to name me that. Uh, but she named me some weird name after my father, my grandfather. Okay. And in the streets, you don't want nobody to know your government name. Yeah, that's true. So you just, that's, that was my name. That's true. You could tell everybody about Tracy. They ain't never going to find her. Because when they come in, I'll be like, no, she don't live here. Right, right. It was rough, but we kind of grew up kind of fast in those streets. Just paying attention to what everybody else is doing. And people will teach you dirt. They'll teach you dirt quicker than they'll teach you knowledge and wisdom and understanding. So so basically, and being from Philly, I, I get what you're saying. Like, you have to, uh, I, I think that in people that live in the inner city, it comes with an automatic street smart mm-hmm. that you really cannot explain. Right. Because right. it's it's about survival. It's about instinct. Right. Literally living off of instinct and to survive. Um, and hustle it's just hustle. You just have to pick it up if you're going to survive or what works for you. So like I said, being from Philadelphia, I, I, I didn't get into a lot of trouble until I was probably about like 13, 14. But at that time, it was more about, um, I think my issue was just boys was always trying to, you know, it was, it was that era where you start filling out. And uh, matter of fact, now that I think about it, every time we went to school, these little dirty old men would always say that song, Brick House. They was just perps. Did you read, did you hear in the book when I tell the story about the horse? No. Share that about the us. horse. So I was probably 14. But 14 year olds in the 70s were real 14 year olds. They wasn't in the boys, girls, nobody. They were 14 year olds going to school, get the education. Right. And that's all you could do. And my cousin took me horseback, was trying to take me horseback riding. So I paid my $10, get my horseback license. I remember, you remember? I remember that. And I yeah. look over at the horse, <laughs> and this thing is to the ground. I'm like, what is that? I guess I had never seen a, anything naked but myself. Mama gave us all our baths together, so I would never even seen my own sister naked or anything, or another human being naked. Right. And I'm just standing there, and I'm in shock. So I was scared of boys. <laughs> and when they tried to talk to me and things, I would, I would not. Mm-hmm. So I grew up a little different when it came to um, boys my age as well. I, that wasn't enough because I had a little more knowledge. Like it, I guess I was a sophomore in high school, and everybody was smoking marijuana. This was just a big thing. And I tried, you know, and I'm like, half sleep. I'm like, oh no, I got things to do, places to go, people to see. Mm-hmm. So I never smoked it anymore. And one day I thought about buying it and selling it. So I went to a guy and he sold me a big giant bag for $20. I'm looking at, I mean, it's so much, I could roll a hundred joints with it. Mm-hmm. And I did. And that was my. Freshman, sophomore, junior year yeah. of just, I would ask my mom for money to get that lunchroom cookie. She said, she don't have it. She, I got 15 cents, 15 cents to go to school, 15 cents yeah. to come home and not a dime. And I was tired. Can, and, and look, can we stay right there? Cause okay. I don't think people get it. And I'm so glad um, that somebody like, our walks might be different. 
but I, I was one of them where I got tired of no, 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 right. no, no. Right. So you had to learn how to make your money. Right. So mine was pity pat. But we made money because we wanted to eat, we gambled, whatever we wanted to go and do because and we, we got it. Parents couldn't do it, couldn't have it, yada, yada, yada. But how easy it was that those no's turned us into hustlers. It did because everybody would go. I had to eat that school lunch and at Dunbar, we had that dirt dry burger, my chocolate milk, maybe some French fries, and everybody else was drinking soda pop. I didn't have a soda pop till I was a grown woman. Oh wow! I could never afford a soda pop, and unless we we had Kool Aid at home, so I never really knew what pop tastes like. I know my grandma had A and W root beer, but she didn't give us none. <laughs> right? We had, we had Kool Aid. <laughs> right, right. Anyway. Right. I sat in the window one day and I watched them eat a pole of sausage and chips and soda off the truck and I'm sitting in there eating my dry burger and that's the day my life changed. I said, I got to do something. I'm tired of this. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of the poverty. So I started stealing. My mama called me a petty thief. If I need it, I want it, I'm taking it. Mm -hmm. So what did you steal? Anything I needed okay. and wanted, I took it. But we're, okay, so, so <laughs> God like, forgive me, Lord. Oh, God help me. So like, I mean, like, did, did you like? Because our generation went through the whole phase of people that was boots and clothes out of um, Lauren Taylor's, and did y'all do any of that back then? I don't know. I did. She just said she <laughs> I did. <laughs> I was just taking whatever I needed. That was it. Oh Lord! When I got, when I got pregnant at seventeen. I'm like, well, what's this baby gonna wear? <laughs> so that was the easiest thing to steal was this little baby, baby yeah. pair of little blue jeans. Right. Just ball that up in my hand, put it in my pocket. And um, when I got to Texas, I walk in the store, I'm like, really? Right. Really? Right, oh, right. Wow. And the saga continues. 26 years later, I got it together. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, oh, I'm tired of being broke, y'all. So what, how did that feel? Um, go back to when, how that, let's do it this way. So 14 years old, mm -hmm. you know, your first, your first encounter with weed and different things. And of course the hustle was on. So when did the boy factor come into place? Did you ever date? Um, or was it anything like dating or? In high school, I started dating, I guess, my sophomore year. And a guy stood me up for prom, and I was like, okay. I got a lot of disappointment from uh, the young guys that I dated, so I started dating older, which was my son's father. He had a car, he didn't go to my school, he was different, and uh, it didn't work out so great, but. I, I, I dated guys probably two, three, four years older than me. Mm -hmm. And then when, once I got a driver's license, I really wanted the guy with the car because now I can drive the car. Um, and I got pregnant at 17 and had my son. I had a simple life. But now 16 is where my life starts to spiral out of control due to rape. Okay, tell us about that. Well, I was 16 years old, believe it or not, trying to sell the marijuana. Mm. This guy said, well, let us check it out. I get in the car. What'd I do that for? The rest would be would change my life forever. Oh. Uh, these two guys raped me, and I froze. I, I, didn't have the, I didn't have the fight. I didn't have the flight. I just froze, but that was my motive. Mm -hmm. That was the, the only way to survive. I could fight these guys. They can beat the crap out of me. They can beat me and then rape me. So I'm thinking, but I'm frozen. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, get it over with. It's just sex because I had sex before. I think once, once, once I opened myself up to sex, it's almost like the devil say, oh, you ready? Oh, you're grown now, huh? Come on and I'm gonna beat you up. And he beat me up. Yeah. And I never told anybody until I wrote this book about that encounter. Wow. My mom was like, wow, mm -hmm. why? Because you was gonna whoop me. I didn't want them to whoop me. Yeah. You think I want you to whoop me? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because you're right. Um, same thing coming up, it was like, if I go home and tell, I'm gonna get in trouble. Right. So let me go ahead and do it. But I like something you said and it's funny to hear another woman say it because when I was young and was taken advantage of, it was like once you had already been open, right? It was just a matter of endure. Just endure. Exactly. 
Exactly. And I think that for women, right? Because once you're open, it's more like, okay, learn to take it and keep moving. It, it kind of builds in a hardness that you can't explain. Right. But once that hardness is there, everybody else can just layer on top of it. Right. Which makes us come off a little, um, what they call, aggressive. Somebody called me abrasive. I said, what, okay, like steel wool? <laughs> <laughs> like sandpaper? <laughs> right, 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 right. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. But, but the streets do something different to you. It's not a, it's like, a, like okay, so all my kids are military kids. They have no street whatsoever. Okay. And what they think they have, I'm like, you couldn't even survive two hours right. in Philadelphia. Exactly. Don't think that where you've been since you've been grown has been it. It's been the grace that has kept you. So when they look at me like I have an older son and I deal with kids, and so they don't even, I don't think, understand the why I do what I do, but it's because I was the kid that was abused. I was the kid that was picked on. I was the kid that was raped. I was the kid. So my give back is because of where I come from. Right. Now they got their degrees or they got their whatever and they think they know. But I'm thinking, I'd be like, God, please show these people who their mama is because they don't get the edge I got and why I have the edge. Right. You know? Well, you know something that we don't give our kids credit for is where they do learn the streets, and that's the music they listen to. Rap music, grow, they grow up listening to what mind what, <laughs> what they don't thug, know what the, what the thug has to say, and then they're doing what they hear right. the, or television, movies. True. Uh, Scarface, just was, certain that was, movies. That was the movie, right? right. So um, I, you can never tell. Do you know the that you like helping younger people, but the 16, 17, 18, 19? Mm -hmm. I don't I want know. them nowhere around. I know they're crazy. Yeah. Oh, I no know. respect. No, none. No respect. They go. They, they, they gonna learn something fast. Yeah. Yeah. None. So I look at them and I like, boy, you mm -mm. just don't even know. Wait a minute, look. <laughs> look. No, it's so true because I'm gonna tell you, like, when I when I did get my life together, you know, and um, now I have a company, Major Youth Advocacy. We advocate for you. Okay. But let's be honest. When I first, when God first told me, I was like, I know you don't want me to be dealing with nobody's no. kids. Because no. I remember, this is a true story, I'm not even going to name the church because everybody would know, but my daughter reminds me. And so we came to church one day and, you know, hey, good morning, how you doing, whoop, whoop, whoop. And so one of the teens was like, who you talking to? And I looked like, what you say? Girl, 
had him by his throat <laughs> like he was mine. And I'm, so, I'm sorry, who the hell is you talking to? It just came, the Philly came out like it wasn't nothing. And till this day, my daughter be like, you remember when you had Tobias by his throat? I was like, listen, I was, I was still growing. But that was my concern of, of saying, God, you sure you got the right person for the job? And so, to be honest, and I will tell you, I've had one little, little guy raise up to me. Because they saw me with a little dress on, you know, a little makeup on. They thought I was from Texas. <laughs> so he said something crazy. And I was like, nigga, who are you talking to? Like, I, the feeling just come out. But what I learned was this. And I told God, I'm going to go to jail for hitting somebody. Like, just don't do this. And he said, no, Sam. He said, you survived it. You know how to reach it. You ain't got, like, I've never been like a cusser. But it was like, just talk to him. Exactly. And it, it but I never thought I could do it. Because, again, I'm afraid you're going to kill him because they are disrespectful. But when I began to build that relationship, I was really shocked. And it was like, okay, Miss Sam, you cool, you cool. You well, know? I was talking to a young lady in my church yesterday. And she was telling me how they, I'm a, I'm a, a class A driver, but I drive, I prefer to drive buses instead of big rigs. And the children messed my head up to where I was homicidal. It was gonna kill every kid on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me tell you the story. Wait so, a minute, what? I'm a bus driver and I'm driving my bus and I reach down to do something. And when I reach, things start falling out my head. <laughs> so I pull the, I, I pull the bus over. And it was sunflower seeds, spitballs, um, just pieces of paper. Right, but mostly right, it was right. these wet sunflower seeds. Right, right. So my brain <laughs> shifts and I look up in the mirror and I stop the bus and I look at the closest kid to me. I say, who put this stuff on me? And the kid's like, I don't know. So I drive the bus, I'm trying to get to a school, right. but inside my head I hear, drive them off the cliff. I really, <laughs> I don't know how I was going to get off the bus because I was going to kill them kids. Oh, I had never felt so oh, abused. My God. I'm on the phone. <laughs> I'm sure when they train bus drivers, I'm the, the video. Right. Because I'm trying to call my boss. It's a camera right. over my head and I know it. Right. I don't care. I don't care about the camera. They're disrespecting me. These kids, they think they're going to all die. <laughs> I call my mom, mama say, Tracy, Tracy, pull the bus over. I say, I can't. They got to be in a safe zone. I got to go. And she said, just right. keep going till you find a school. So I get, I pull up. The cops say, I need you to move that bus. I say, no, you move the bus. <laughs> I step off the bus and I sit on the curb. I talk to my mother. And uh, the kids, so, the, so before I do that, I cut the heat on in Texas. It's like May. Right. And I tell the kids, welcome to hell. And I burn them up with the heat blazing. Right, right. I got the oh, AC God. on me, oh, right? God. Right. I get off, and the, the uh, Fort Worth ISD beg me. They tell me we have no one, not a driver, that can replace you right now. I need you to get those kids home. Their mothers are starting to call the ISD. I said, No. I said, You said it's okay for them to spit on me? Right. That's okay with you? Right. It's not okay with me. Oh, Come get your bus. Stop what you're doing. As the kids are trying to climb out the bus window, they screaming, please miss, please miss. Now this the funny part. I don't know these children are from Ecuador and all over some parts mm. of the world. And they don't understand English. So when I'm talking to them, they looking like this. And I'm telling them, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> I don't play with no kids. <laughs> and the kids are like, oh my God. I say, one of y'all gonna tell me I want to grab one to see if right, I get one to, right. to snitch. But they right. were not snitch. So the cop comes, he said, ma'am, calm down. I found out who did it. Right. I say, who? He said, I can't tell you. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so right. I get on the bus. I wish I could go and show you. Uh, I got a little bus back there when I do my demonstration. So right. this, this is the school bus. This is me driving the school bus. Right. And the kids, I got a heat, I got a heat right. <laughs> the, the kids are screaming, please, miss, it's hot, it's hot, please, miss, it's hot. It's hot. <laughs> I just take oh my, my time, God. I pull up to the school, and all the parents are running to the bus. This is the last bus in Texas with children on it on this particular oh day. And I got all these right. people's kids. And what they didn't know was these kids had messed with my mental health. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and I didn't know how to control it. <laughs> so they was in trouble. But you want to hear that story here? <laughs> oh, God, that's too funny. I, ca I can't even imagine. So how, so how did you... Um, Get them home. Did you like come to get some? Real slow. No, I I, I burned them up and I oh, <laughs> kept God. that heat on and drove very, very, very slow. And I look up in the mirror at him every now and again. And when I got away, it was going to cut the air on so when their parents come, the bus would be cool. And I was, like I said, it's, I bet it's on videotape when they say, don't, when this is a lady that works for us, don't, <laughs> don't fool do her. this. No, don't, don't <laughs> do this because, um, I had I didn't even know what I was doing. I was I'd never been that angry. I don't think at a child, so I know children ain't my strong point. Right, right, right. Oh. That's too funny. Okay, that was good. That was that. Somebody got to laugh because I'm enjoying that. Oh. I am so enjoying that. Hey. Hey. When I said I quit, and the lady was like, "Okay, stand right here." I see you not gonna ask me what happened. You don't care. <laughs> right, I they know didn't they didn't care. care. Oh my god. They already that knew. That was funny. Now, they know they need to offer counseling to them people to school. <laughs> but you know what? Because you be wondering sometimes, because we hear these little cases and they say, well, we got the, the, the bus driver hit the child or whatever, whatever. That. Yeah, I, I get it now. <laughs> I get it now. All right, so listen, we took a little break and we are back. Did you see the school bus? So look, you got to now look, y'all y'all see the school bus, right? Come on now. So so that's your reminder to never drive a school bus, and how easy it is for your mental health to be affected by someone else. I put the heat on and I drove this bus two miles per hour, and I knew where I had to take them, but I refused to go more than two miles so I could burn them up real hot. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, then when I got them to the destination, of course, I cut the heat on so the, the mother, cut the air on so the mother wouldn't know. I'm sure they told me. Right, right. Uh, I was going to deny it, but that was the camera funny. couldn't tell I had the heat on. So right. So it saw me say, welcome to hell. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, too funny. Anyway. That's a good reminder. I know y'all got that uh, laugh. You got your laugh out. That was good. Uh, so, so, I was, so while we were on a little break, I was asking her about Caprini Green. Like, if you are a 80s maybe baby or whatever everybody knew about candy man okay and then of course jordan came back and redid it so i was asking um you know did she know much about it but um she was saying that wasn't her you know her territory but what i did think was fascinating she talked about the medicine cabinets tell us about that yeah the medicine cabinets you could take out one that's how he moved around and he would go in the empty buildings, I believe, the empty apartments, right. from medicine cabinet to medicine cabinet. That's how he transported through buildings. I don't know much about the story, really. But uh, that was really something that happened with the medicine. Because um, I remember her, I remember them taking it out, and I was thinking, was it even possible for people to, uh, I guess, maybe harass other people or, you know? Not in my apartment. That's a, I don't think, when I think about my medicine cabinet, did I ever try to mess with it? So like, obviously, yeah, I never weird. knew about the story Candyman because I, I would have been trying to do the medicine cabinet. <laughs> I lived on the 10th floor of Stateway Garden, which I was way up there. And uh, I sold crack cocaine. And I sold it a little differently than everyone else. Everybody sold powder in Chicago in 1980s, about eight, 1983. But I knew how to turn it into rocks. So how did you elevate from going from weed to the next thing? How did that go well, like that? Well, so it was 1982, and this guy went into, his mom had left him $50,000. Uh, they, they sold the house. Him mm -hmm. and his sister, they were both gonna get $50,000 for the house, but the sister actually bought him out and kept the house. She's wanted us out. So he started selling all his mom's belongings and things like that. He just wanted to go to Chicago and take this money and be this big drug dealer. And I just remember he was just sitting, rocking in the chair. And I asked him one day, I say, outside we had a lemon tree, a lime, a lemon lime tree, an avocado and a mango tree. Well, I know 
with the lemon lime is. But this avocado and mango. I'm from mm -hmm. Chicago. I ain't never seen no fruit like this. Right. So I go in there, I ask him, and I hold, had the avocado. I say, is this a fruit or a vegetable? I had cut it. I had tasted it. Is it do I put right. salt on it? Do I put sugar? This man beat me. He kicked me all in my stomach. Just beat me. And, I'm, and uh, I never understood why or didn't understand what I was going through at that time in my life with this crack had gotten uh, in the south it wasn't crack it wasn't cocaine and water and baking soda it was cocaine ether and baking soda oh turn it to something called crank mm. and when what it did to people I don't know but he was different put it like that and so uh, we had no money they, so wait a minute. So he was on that stuff, and uh -huh. that's what led him to respond that way. Yes, we had. Oh, wow. I don't know. I think it was. Just, he was just. It was something going on with his mind and his dead mother. I got you. And uh, and you stayed after. I mean, well, it it was it was it was that was in the, that was later. Okay. Okay. When we got there, there was no. There, I only just had these trees to eat. And I'm like, what are we gonna eat? What are we gonna eat? So of course I started stealing hot dogs and. Mm -hmm. I would walk through the store and I'd have my son. We couldn't even afford a uh, a buggy for the child, uh, uh, you know, the little carriage, a uh, mm -hmm. stroller. Right, right. So I stole the buggy. That's his stroller, right? Mm -hmm. So I put him in the, in the stroller. And it was Christmas time. He loved the lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would take him to the store and I would hold this bottle with one hand with my finger there. And I would pour the milk and I'd be looking like that, like I'm shopping. And I feel it come to the top, I put the top on and put it in his bag and I do another one and another one. And that's wow. the only way I could take care of my son. Wow. And stole stealing hot dogs to this guy. He would, I think, after, I might be wrong, after he did that, I wouldn't even talk to him no more. Then Sandy, I learned, that's why I wanted to take that state out. I learned about right. home invasion, but mine was, it was a home invasion, but it was more, it was a home invasion. I would go into people's homes and I had a guy that wanted to buy the cable box. He gave me $100 for the cable box. I will take a gun, I will take jewelry, I will take money, but I just wanted the cable box. And just anything quick. And one day I went in these people's house in their sleep. And I walk in the bedroom, going to do my normal thing. And they laying in the bed and I'm stuck like this. Fry, uh, why is this don't freeze? I froze, I'm like, oh my God. Oh. oh, wow. So I started walking backwards. That's what I knew what a cat burglar was. And I walked backwards. I <laughs> walked backwards like a cat. Right. I told the guy with me, abort mission. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That same guy, it was this guy, he was 16. I was 18. And uh, I had taught him how to do this. Well, he must have got too much, too many items one particular night and he decided to take, take a run for it to keep everything for itself. And um, I never saw him again. One day, uh, the, the house gets sold. I got all my stuff packed up. I can't wait to get to my mother because he ain't never going to see me no more. Right. I'm leaving right. my son's father. I'm done. And when I start the car up, I see the police behind me put the light on the dashboard. There I am with all oh, these people jury on like a dummy. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God I'm touching my, like a dummy. And the cop, they take my son, they put him in a foster home. They take my son's father, they put him in a jail cell. And they take me and they put me in an interrogation booth and they bring this dude out and say, do you know him? I'm like, yeah, I bought some stuff from him a few times, I do believe. Man, what you know about the robberies? I say, excuse me? What do you know about the robbery? I don't know what you're talking about. Interrogation was about 15 minutes long and all they said was, tell us about the robbery. What do you know? I said, and I, I just said, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. He said, get her out of here. And that was the end of that. They got all the jewelry back anyway right, because right. I was wearing it, you know, some of it. And uh, I got my son the next day in court. He, uh, I didn't have to go through anything because I wasn't arrested. Right. I don't know what the father told him, but he deserved. He stayed in there about five days. In the five yeah. days, Sandy, I'm in this house, and we had called the electric company, told him to cut the lights off. Mm -hmm. So I had this one-year-old child, the mama dad in that room, the aunt dad in that room. I'm in this room with the one-year-old child, and my brain just. Shh. 
Mm -hmm. I'm seeing things. I'm hearing things. I'm feeling spirits from these women. What have you done to my son? The Jamaicans. Jamer he was like a Jamaican, but they were Jamaican. Uh, got, I, and I, and I, and I kind of freak out a little bit, but never really told nobody about that, 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 that point in my life. Um, but I knew I was doing wrong. Right, I knew I was doing right. wrong. I believe at this time I find the Bible. Right, right. And I asked God to please come help me and save me because the I, thought, I feel like these women's spirits, they this is their grandson. They never got to meet. Mm -hmm. This this would be the lady's grandson. Mm. Oh, I felt like I had. Oh, they was casting spells or doing something. Oh man, and it was it, it was the weirdest <coughs> thing. So this house had started. It wasn't a house. It was me. Um, if I tried to try that drug I was telling you about, if I even took one little hit of it. When I would go to the window, I had hallucinations out of this world. And so I, I would go get his father and say, this is before he went to jail, I'm like, do you see that? I, I said, just watch the tree. And we'd be like this watching the tree. And I said, man, he got him. And he had a police hat on and everything. I could see this clear as a bell. What it was was my brain was too young for this drug. And my brain couldn't, you know, they, they call it a, a controlled substance because it's going to mm. control you. Right. But when your brain isn't fully developed, I'm going to be 17, 18 years old. It did something else to my brain. It made me. So, 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 <clears throat> this is interesting. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> so, being a prophet, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for being a prophet, we are gifted with sight and sound. Like, all your five senses are heightened in ways that don't make normal sense to people. And when I was listening to the monk, I thought about that. I says, well, I said, well, Lord, she sounded like she was prophetic, but not knowing it and then taking a drug to heighten your senses the wrong way. Mm -hmm. That was what I thought about and what I picked up. And then the other thought I had <clears throat> was I know when I was coming up and crack was hitting the streets and stuff was going on. Some people would try stuff one time and they weren't coming back. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, um, I don't know if it was a combination of both. You, you know what I mean? Because though the audience is listening to you for the first time, had not, you know, listened to her book or read it, that will definitely be made available. In the, in I the, questioned that. In the first chapter, you talking about my Aunt Lois? I just mean, no, <clears throat> I just mean in general. You remember like, my Aunt Lois in the chapter one? I don't remember names. Okay. Oh, well, she was my aunt that killed herself. Oh, her yes. Was a oh, time. my God. Yeah. And I called my mama and say, did she have black hair? I was like, well, yeah, we all got black hair. I'm like, long, pretty black hair. And I remember this lady, and I couldn't have been but a, this big. But I can't remember this lady that loved yeah. me. Right. And then she was gone. I remember when she was gone, and she wasn't there no more. Mm -hmm. And I looked. Every, they didn't know what I was looking for. Anybody walk in the room, I thought it would be her. Because she always helped me. So we would say... Um, but this is so good, too, because we would say, oh, that was your prophetic gift, meaning that this may not be the right time to do it on screen, but it does mean that you're prophetic. You just didn't know it and nobody was able to tell you about it. So here, basically, so the advantage my kids had, they were young and I was able to say, if you dream, if you see this or that, it's normal. See what I'm saying? Right. That's just your prophet, uh, your prophetic gift trying to come through. But in this case, you didn't have anybody there to tell you or to show you what was going on. So to you, it may have seemed like, okay, I'm tripping, losing my mind, yada, 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 but you weren't. But when you don't have anybody that understands what's going on with you, then you have to kind of, as you did, you figure things out the hard way. But you weren't. <coughs> I think, uh, thinking, um, just kind of going to touch up on what you were saying, it was a point in my life where I was a pretty savvy young lady, and I'm watching a young man talk within my trap house, and he's talking, and I can read everything he's saying, and I said, who are you telling my address to? And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Of course, I go crazy, get my boyfriend, I said, get him up out of here. <laughs> I want him, he said, who are you talking to? He's like, I want to talk to him. I said, you said my address. You know, and I, I, start, I start shooting at him. Oh, I'm going to kill him, you know, because if, right. you, if you'll set me up, right. I might as well do you first. Right. So anyway, um, I don't know what that was because how did I do that? I'm watching his mouth 
say mm -hmm. 30, say my address. And I'm like, mm -hmm. so I sit there and I wait. And after he says it, he gets off the phone. I said, who are you talking to? Just my friend. And this was his right hand man. That's right. the cold part. Mm -hmm. um, when he died, in fact, that guy was standing there. You could clearly see he had AIDS. He's standing at the coffin, right? So this, okay, so this is really good. So we can't go into all her testimony. Oh, but okay, I, okay. But no, no, no. But okay. this is this is really good because um, this is what it looks like when you have a kid that is gifted with sight, mm -hmm. but they don't know and understand what they see. So when we was coming up, <clears throat> we called it reading people. Meaning, this, that was a street language. Like you said, you could walk in, you could spot out what was going to happen, what was going on. You could zoom in. That we called, oh, I, I just read that. It wasn't even a big thing. You know what I mean? So I wasn't raised in church, so I had no church lingo at all. But then, years, years later, I was like, oh, man, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what was going on. And that's the same thing you got. And if ain't nobody never told you before, I am telling you it's clear as day. And many kids who are not raised in church don't have that background or whatever the case is. They have these giftings of dreams coming out or how they could go in and read a room. Or like you said, you you're, you zone, your mind zone in and you could hear what was being said. It's, it's normal. It's probably more normal now than what people want to talk about. So then, yeah, you, you know, yeah, okay, you crazy, you tripping, whatever. But in all honesty, nobody ever told you that you had a prophetic gift that was in full operation. Well, And I, then the problem with that was, here's the flip side. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the devil uh -huh. knows you got the gift. Uh -huh. So I can see very easily where he's trying to use it to distort, to try and kill you on every chance because a gift like that is rare. When you can just see things. Like One that. thing that I always told people, anybody that really knows me, uh, I can feel danger a mile away. Mm -hmm. I can feel it's coming. Somebody come. I can feel it. I can feel it coming. Right. Something is coming, and I'm not opening the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. you messing with you messing with fire. Right. So I can feel it. I can meet somebody and look at them, and I can read they BS right in their face. Exactly. And. Not today, not today, right. you know, and shut it down. And nobody ever like... I prayed for that gift, I prayed for it. Oh, you, oh, yeah. When I was writing this book, I had to mm -hmm. stop the world. Right. Uh, this was uh, 2003, I didn't have my restaurant yet. 2003, I say, God, I was, you know, trying to figure out who, who I was. Mm -hmm. And I want to write this book, I want to tell the story of what happened to me. I just woke up one day and I just want to tell. I had told it to little people along the ways. And um, I go get a computer and I start typing my story. One letter at a time, couldn't type. I wrote that whole book, one finger at a time like that. And one day I get to a part and I can't cope. I'm like, oh Lord, what happened to me? Now all of it is just like, how did you survive all this? What's going on with you? And I break down. Mm. And uh, um, and I could feel the pot, the presence of God in the room behind me. It looked like Jesus in a white robe, but it just I just froze, froze, I froze. I'm like, oh, you right there to help me. Because I, 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 it hurt me so to my soul that these people had done this to me. And I couldn't pay them back. Right. That's the problem. I know, I know. So yeah. I couldn't cope. I couldn't go forward. I couldn't go nowhere. So I had to write this stuff down to get it out of here. And mm. I heard the power of God. I heard the voice of God say, write it. I said, why did you let them do that to me? Why? Why? Mm. Why? And I'm just crying, crying. And God said, I hear God say, write it. And I feel this behind me. But it was on this side. And I go like that, and it was gone. Mm -hmm. And I, I was kind of, I think I was changed that day. I, I really do. I'm all, I've been a mover shaker for a long time trying to make something happen. And I did pretty good at making stuff happen. So... I want this big Hollywood money. So I'm going to write this movie myself, right? And I right. write this whole movie out, but in the midst of it, I break down and I'm mm -hmm. mentally disturbed by it. And the man, well, I didn't get to, to build up to my entire story, which is in my book. The guy that lived in the project with me, let's put it like that. We're going to call him K-Town. K-Town is dead. K-Town is gone. Uh, he died with AIDS. But he um, lost my place. 
he dies in real life in 2001. So I wrote the book. I started writing in 2001. He dies of AIDS. Mm. And there starts mental health problems. I did not want no part of AIDS. Mm. Uh, you ain't gonna give me no needle. I, I never use no needle. I don't want to talk about it. If I got it, I got it. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I right, right, I right. Now, I want to know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know. And so these doctors are saying, we got to know. Did I do it again? No, these doctors are saying, we need to, to do this test. I said, oh, I don't like needles. I did, I did anything yeah. to not take the test. Yeah, I remember that in the book. We mm -hmm. don't tell them that yet. Okay. I remember okay. that. Okay. I remember. Y'all going to have to okay. wait on that one. Okay. Um,